Boys, played by the Edison Military Band. Subject today is the Spanish American War. Remember where we left off? We had been talking about America dipping its toe into the uh, world of imperialism, uh, which was a departure from our history of isolationism. We looked at that going all the way back to the presidency of George Washington and you know, added on with the Monroe Doctrine that, that policy was one that the United States established early in its history and was basically the rule of thumb for a hundred years of American history. And so here we're looking at how the United States becomes an imperial power. We've we've looked at some of the things that the United States did, like the uh, annexation of Hawaii. You looked at the construction of the Panama Canal. Here's a, Here's another... Uh, leg on that tripod, the Spanish-American War, which is seemingly rather random. How does the United States get into a war with Spain when the farewell address of George Washington said, we're only going to get involved in wars that are, are direct threats to American security? So it's interesting choice for um, America's first European conflict like this. It was a war that the Secretary of State, John Hay, referred to as a splendid little war. And from the American perspective, it is that. It is a quick American victory, and many of the war aims are achieved with relatively little bloodshed. So let's look at this splendid little war. First thing you need to understand about the Spanish-American War from the American perspective is that there's no single spark or cause of the war. Uh, as I've oftentimes said in the past, that there's no Pearl Harbor for this conflict. You know, there's no one single event where we look at it and say, you know, that's it. We have to go to war. It's either that or give up our territorial independence. What we see here is a series of smaller events that is going to push for a decision to go to war. The United States is not going to have war thrust upon it it is going to make the decision, all right, we have to do this thing. And we need to understand that there's there's no fight for survival here. The United States at no point is under threat of some sort of Spanish invasion where they're going to be marching on Washington, D.C. or New York City. This is no fight for survival. So let's look at what the causes are. And they really fall under these four headings. Um, the Cuban Rebellion, the DeLome Letter, Yellow Journalism, and the USS Maine. So let's look at each one of these causes of the Spanish-American War one by one. First, and, and it really, almost the whole story revolves around the idea of the Cuban Rebellion. Cuba is a Spanish territory at this time, and this is actually a Cuban revolt for independence, Cuba Libre. Um, this, which was not their first attempt. This was the third attempt, and this one begins in 1895. And if you look at the situation here, you you can kind of see where the United States is going to give its moral support. You have a small overmatched colony that is fighting for independence from a European, an established European colonial power. Who whose story does that sound like? It's ours. It's it's the American story. You know, just a little over a century later. So, of course, we're going to be on the side of the Cubans as they fight to free themselves from the shackles of a a European colonial power. So that's going to be kind of the, the beginning of this. And the Spanish general in charge of this... Uh, General Weiler is using concentration camps to try and isolate the rebels. The basic idea there is that there's a large number of Cubans that are are stirring up the trouble in Weiler's opinion. And so he's going to take anybody that's associated with this Cuban independence effort and he's going to put them in concentration camps. Now, uh, don't get confused by this. A lot of times students, you know, with, with the studies of the Holocaust, make a leap to this being a death camp. That's that's not the case. He's trying to isolate and concentrate the, the rebels so they can keep an eye on them. But not surprisingly, with the uh, health and, you know, the nutritional status of these concentration camps, there's going to be widespread Cuban deaths. There's going to be 200,000 Cubans die in these concentration camps. Now, to 
to put that in perspective, that would make this one of the deadliest wars in American history. The only if this were an American war with two hundred thousand deaths, it would be third behind the American Civil War and World War II. This would be more deadly than World War One from the American perspective. So this is just wholesale slaughter of the Cuban people. Now, there might be a lot of sympathy for what the Cubans are going through, but remember, this is something that is you know, not under our heading of the, this isn't our business, according to Washington's farewell address and the Monroe Doctrine. It's not like the Spanish are trying to come claim new land under the Monroe Doctrine. We said no new territories are to be conquered. So under our traditional policy of isolationism, this is not our business. But the humanitarian side and the side of this that points to the fact that this is only 90 miles off of the coast of the United States. You know, if you go to the southern tip of Florida, Cuba is really close to the United States, literally. And so this is a story that is near and dear to American hearts. Now, another reason why this is going to become an issue, as we've talked about at other times in our studies of history, you know, if we go back to our look at the Civil War, how Uncle Tom's Cabin was you know, something that was a major player in bringing about the Civil War. It opened the eyes of the northern people to the, the plight of the slaves, most of which you know, the northerners had never actually seen in person and never would see. But the, the stories that they read in Uncle Tom's Cabin brings it home to them. Well, in this case, it's going to be U.S. newspapers that are going to bring this story home to the average American. And really what it comes down to is there's two compu- competing newspapers in New York City owned by Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. And what they're trying to do is find that next story to sell newspapers. You know, this is, it's a little different. Um, You know, if you guys are growing up in a world where newspapers are a a dying business, you know, not many people are actually buying the actual newspaper from the newsstand at, at the store and taking home, taking that home with them. You guys are getting your news sources from all sorts of internet sort you know, places instead. And even I was raised in a world where newspaper was important for getting the the news out, but there was only one here in St. Louis for most of my life. You know, there's only been the Post-Dispatch. The the Globe Democrat was another newspaper, but it closed down in the mid 80s in in St. Louis. So there really wasn't any competition with the Post-Dispatch. If I was going to get the news, it was going to be from buying the Post-Dispatch. That was not the case, especially in New York where there were dozens of newspapers. And so if you were a news consumer, the person that was walking up to the newsstand to buy a newspaper, you were going to have many, many, many options. Well, what is it that's going to make you grab one newspaper over another? There has to be some kind of story or something about the headlines or some picture on that that cover that says, you know what, I'm going to grab that one and figure, find out what that story is about. So they are looking for the next um, sensational story to report on. And this is going to be a source of those stories. Um, One of the famous stories associated with this, William Randolph Hearst, when this rebellion in Cuba is beginning to become a story, sends a a very famous artist by the name of Frederick Remington, who who has become a, a... a household name in the United States at that time, doing a lot of art based out West. Well, Hearst hires him to go and report and provide uh, illustrations of what's happening in the war in in Cuba. And when Remington gets there, he finds that there's not a whole lot to report on. So he sends a telegraph back to Hearst in New York City. What do you want me to do? Um, there's nothing, there's no war for me to report on. And her famous response is you provide the pictures, I'll provide the war. So if you give me something to report upon, I will stir this up into something and make people want to fight. Okay. This is more than just reporting the news. This is making the news. And this is awesome. You know, it's something else to tie back into things that we've talked about this, this brand of yellow journalism, 
is happening essentially simultaneously with the muckrakers. You know, we look, that's the late 1800s, early 1900s. Those reporters that were, you know, in Roosevelt's terms early on were stirring up trouble. You know, we can probably think of modern examples, you know, of where that you've got the news, not just reporting the news, but but actually making the news. Now, one other thing to, to kind of understand here is why is it called yellow journalism of all the terms that you could use to you know name this sensationalist reporting that's occurring here? Why is it called yellow journalism? Both of the newspapers had competing versions of an incredibly popular um, cartoon strip called The Yellow Kid, which was pretty brown, groundbreaking at this time that they had color that they were able to use in their cartoon comic strips. Uh, I've looked at some of the Yellow Kid cartoons. I can I'm only I can only assume that a lot of this stuff is inside jokes. You know, you can see there Holly G say, this is great stuff. I, I don't know what's supposed to be funny about that, but I guess if you're around in 1898, maybe there was some sort of something in the news or some sort of in joke but it was he was immensely popular popular the yellow kid and so the papers that had the yellow kid were the yellow papers thus the term yellow journalism that's why this practice of sensationalist yellow newspaper reporting yellow journalism comes to be called that all right so there's a couple of pictures of william randolph hearst and joseph pulitzer Today, the highest prize that one can win in newspaper reporting is the Pulitzer Prize. And if that name sounds familiar to you here in St. Louis, there is a local tie. Joseph Pulitzer was one of the founders of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. If you you know, ever actually get your hands on a paper copy of the Post-Dispatch, and I know that's not as common as it used to be, if you go to the editorial page, there's a, you know, a quote that they have there from Pulitzer about what his post-dispatch is going to set out to do. And so they run that in the editorial page every day. Okay, so Hearst and Pulitzer. And so here's some examples of some of that yellow journalism. In fact, this is, if you look closely there, you can see this says it was drawn by Frederick Remington, Spaniards search women on American steamers. Now, before I point it out, take a look at that for a second and see what might be noteworthy about this drawing and you'll notice that she's naked so this is a strip search and you can see that you've got these you know the the spaniards here are kind of you know surrounding this naked american woman and creeping on her here you know so this is obviously designed to get every red-blooded you know american male fired up to go fight the spanish because of what they're what they're doing here you know whether or not this actually occurred now that's of lesser importance to them. All right, let let him let go of him, McKinley, as you can see the headline there. And McKinley was the president at this time, President William McKinley. Um, and you can see McKinley here is holding on to Uncle Sam. He's got him by the coattails. Uncle Sam is trying to roll up his sleeves and he's grabbing his sword and he's about ready to step across a little bit of water. Uncle Sam wants to go to war in Cuba. And he's trying to protect this poor symbol of, uh, you know, Cuba. And you see it actually says Cuba on her dress there. And you've got this Spanish buzzard that Uncle Sam wants to defend Cuba from. And the only thing that's stopping Uncle Sam from going and defending Cuba is the president. Let go of him, McKinley. Let's fight. Okay. See Spanish politeness here. Spain is bowing, but he's... And he's taking off his hat but he's got his bloody knife behind him and in both of these if you look there's this sinking ship see that see that well that that's something we're going to get to here in just in just a minute all right the delome letter enrique delome was the spanish ambassador to the united states so he is working in the united states for the spanish government and he is you know, like ambassadors are supposed to do, reporting back to home base, you know, what, what's happening in the country where he's serving. And his report back to Spain mentions that he doesn't think much of President McKinley. He says President McKinley's weak and a bitter for the admiration of the crowd. Relatively harmless criticisms 
But in this time where we're getting increasingly fired up about, you know, should we go fight Spain to defend Cuban and Cuba's honor and what Spain is doing to offend American honor, this suddenly seems like, you know, just these are fighting words. You know, the analogy I oftentimes make and something to think about is, do we say things that are critical of the United States president here? Do Are we as American people critical of the president? Yes, always. And we're supposed to be, you know, we're, we're supposed to constantly remind the president, regardless of their political party, that they're not above us, that they're just one of us. You know, they, they're not, you know, gods or, or some figure above reproach. We, we're critical of them. Again, regardless of political party. In fact, I'm sure most of us have probably said something that is more critical of the president and presidents than that they are weak and a bitter for the admiration of the crowd. But the analogy I've always made is my brother and I, who are very good friends, would oftentimes, when we were playing sports together, we would get in arguments and start yelling at one another and just... People thought they would have to step in because they thought maybe we're going to actually start a fight. And if anybody got between us or picked sides, we would immediately turn on that person. Or if somebody said something critical about my brother, like chimed in, I wasn't going to have that. I can say whatever I want about my brother. He's my brother. I can be as critical of him as I want to be, but you better not be. And I think that's the similar situation here. If you've got a brother or sister or something, you know, even though that, you know, somebody, you've got a friend that, you know, I can make fun of my friends. You can't, you know, they, they're my friends. Um, so th- there's an element of that to this. I can say whatever mean thing I want about my president, but you better not, Mr. Spanish ambassador, man. We're going to have problems. And I said on that last thing there that this was explosive because of the time. And, and there was a point to that. There's a bad transition into this next slide. The, the explosion of the USS Maine is really what's going to push this over the edge. As the United States is getting closer and closer to possible declaration of war with, with Spain over what's happening in Cuba... The United States Navy sends the USS Maine into Havana Harbor, theoretically to protect American citizens from the Cuban rebellion and the the bloodshed associated with that. But part of this is no doubt trying to send a message to the government of Spain that we're here. And on the night of February 15th, 1898, the USS Maine explodes. And remember the Maine, to hell with Spain, becomes a rallying cry for for the war. 260 American sailors die with the explosion of the USS Maine. And what caused it? Well, if, if you were alive at that time, the only explanation that seemed to make any sense was that this had to be the work of the Spanish, that there was some sort of bomb or grenade or torpedo or, you know, something like that that would have caused this to explode. Today, it, it's much more a matter of dispute. In fact, most of the research seems to point to the idea that it was probably something internal to the USS Maine. But people weren't thinking that way. The USS Maine was a top-of-the-line American sailing vessel in 1898. You know, the, Nobody was thinking that there was some sort of design flaw in the USS Maine that led to this explosion. Now, There's the USS Maine in Havana Harbor before February 15th. So that's where it was when it exploded. And like I said, it was top of the line American sailing vessel when it exploded. After the explosion, after it sinks, it doesn't sink very far. It is in a harbor after all. It's not like the Titanic where it's going to sink through a mile of water. It basically just kind of settles down in the mud. So a lot of the USS Maine is still sticking up out of the water. Thus, those cartoons that we saw earlier where you had a, a piece of a ship you know, sticking up out of, out of the water and those ones where they were making fun of Spain. We'll talk about that in a second. The, the, the mass of the USS Maine is in Arlington National Cemetery today. But that's what the wreck of the Maine looked like. Now, how, how did the yellow journalists cover this? 
Main explosion caused by bomb or torpedo. You know, there no doubt, even though there's been no studies done or any kind of analysis at this point, this one's even better from my perspective. The journal here, you know, destruction of the warship Maine was the work of an enemy. They, that's their banner headline. Assistant Secretary Roosevelt convinced the explosion of the warship was not an accident. That's Teddy Roosevelt, who's not yet vice president. In 1898, he's not vice president yet. He's assistant secretary of the Navy. So they have declared that it was the work of the enemy. But if you look all around, they have a $50,000 reward for answering the question, who destroyed the main? Well, I thought they just told us that it was the work of the enemy. But, um, well, maybe they're not so sure, you know. They also are willing to offer offer fifty thousand dollars, and again, those that's the kind of thing that's make going to make you want to grab the New York Journal, right? Fifty thousand dollar reward? Well, what what reward for what? That might be the kind of thing that would make you want to buy the New York Journal. In nineteen eleven, after the war was over, thirteen years after the ship sank, they built a coffer dam. If you look, you can see this wall. They built a coffer dam around the USS Maine and pumped all the water out and did an investigation. And the investigation in 1911 said that if you looked at some of the external hull of the ship, it looked like they were blasted inwards. So the naval investigation in 1911 confirmed the idea that it was the destruction, it, the destruction was caused by the enemy. Now, what they did in 1911, the other reason why they did this was so they could patch it up well enough to raise what was left of the USS Maine and get it out of Havana Harbor. It was blocking the harbor. You know, it was right in the way of everything. So they raised the Maine, took it out into the Caribbean and just let it sink again. So now it is out away from Havana Harbor on the bottom of the Caribbean. And a few years ago, um, Discovery Channel went and did their own investigation of it. And from the best of their computer recreations of when they look at the wreck, it seems to look like what happened was the bulkhead wall that separated the engine room from the ammunition probably wasn't thick enough or insulated enough. And their look at this was that it probably exploded from within. Again, we'll never 100% know everybody that was involved in this is, is long since dead. And, um, you know, they're, they're trying to recreate this with computer regenerations based on the wreckage. And so, you know, there's, there's an element of guesswork, but it seems like this probably was an accident, not the work of the Spanish. But in 1898, the supposition was that it was the work of the Spanish and so Spain is going to have to pay for this. Uh, today, the, the main mast is in Arlington National Cemetery, which is just outside of Washington, D.C. It's the National Cemetery. The main mast is right next to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. You know, if you ever get a chance to go to Arlington National Cemetery, where you go to park for the Tomb of the Unknown, this is essentially right across the road from that. Um a couple of years ago, I drugged my kids with me. We went to Arlington National Cemetery, and that's actually in that base of the memorial. The, the mast goes through the base of the memorial, so and you can enter into the base. And there's the bell of the USS Maine, and that's the actual mast of the USS Maine that I'm touching there. So yeah, a little actual contact with real history there. All right, so what are the... Uh, final straws to break the camel's back here. President McKinley is facing immense political pressure to do something about this. The, the public has been whipped into a war frenzy by the yellow journalists and, and what they feel like have been attacks on American um, security and attacks on America's political reputation. And so what he's going to do what McKinley demands of Cuba is, or of Spain is several things that the one that Spain has to agree to a truce in Cuba, that they have to stop fighting the rebels Two, they have to pay for the USS Maine. 
And three, they have to get rid of the concentration camps in Cuba. Four, they have to agree to Cuban independence. Now, believe it or not, they agree to just about all of these. Um, the only one that the, the Spanish refuse to agree to is the one of Cuban independence. They're actually willing to pay for the destruction of the USS Maine to avoid war, but they, they only agree to three of the four. They're not ready to give up Cuba, you know, which is part of their empire. It's one of the few parts of the Spanish Empire that's left. You, you probably should remember from world history that at one point, Spain was the most dominant power on the face of the planet. You know, going in the, the century right after Columbus, uh, where they're claiming huge swaths of the New World and are extracting huge amounts of wealth from those, those colonies. But by the late 1800s, they, they only have a few vestiges of that left. And Cuba's one of them, and they don't want to give up on that yet. Because they don't agree to all of the demands, McKinley, President McKinley asked for Congress for a declaration of war, and Congress agrees. Now, based on what I've told you here, there's a question for you to roll around in your head for a second here. Is the U.S. justified in getting into this? You know, and there's, there's no right or wrong answer to that. This isn't necessarily our fight, but humanitarian concerns of what's happening in Cuba, you know, maybe it is our fight. So there, there's n no right or wrong answer to that question. Each one of us are probably going to have a different answer to that question. The war itself is not much to talk about. The Spanish fleet is, or the Spanish... Uh, military, including their fleet, wildly overmatched. Spain is a hollow shell of a former empire. What happens is the U.S. destroys the Spanish fleet in one of the uh, Spanish possessions of the Philippines, with a set of islands that are over just south of Japan, you know, on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. And... After that destruction is over, the, the U.S. naval vessels that are in the Pacific are going to join the fight in the Caribbean. Now, if you look at a map of the world, that means that they're going to have to go all the way around and underneath South America before they can join in the fight in the Caribbean. They're essentially not going to get there. Teddy Roosevelt um, is fighting and leading a unit the, the first volunteer cavalry. That means horse-mounted soldiers in this. But they're not, they're never going to get to fight on horseback because they're waiting for naval vessels to haul their horses into the combat zone. And so his his mounted cavalry, is they're never actually going to get to fight on horseback. They're going to fight on foot because of, of the fact that the U.S. Um, f naval forces are taking so long going around South America to get there. This is going to be one of the key reasons why he, when he becomes president, Teddy Roosevelt wants to build the Can Panama Canal more than any other president before him. He has had to sit there and wait for American naval vessels to get to help in, in the Caribbean while he was trying to fight there as the leader of the Rough Riders, that first volunteer cavalry, which is, you know, we've, we've seen some videos about the Rough Riders, kind of an odd cross section of the United States, it, it ties together some of those experiences of Teddy Roosevelt. Remember, Ro Teddy is born this New York blue blood, you know, born into a, all kinds of money. But because of the death of his wife and his mother on Valentine's Day, 1884, he goes and lives with the cowboys out out in the West for you know a handful of years. And so the Rough Riders are going to be a collection of all of his friends, both the the Western cowboys and the New York blue bloods that he grew up with. Taken together, they're known as the Rough Riders. They are going to be key in one of the pivotal battles and one of the few battles that are fought in this war, the Battle of San Juan Hill, which is going to be what launches Teddy Roosevelt as a war hero to the vice presidency and eventually the presidency, and that's why he ends up on Mount Rushmore. Okay, So the war doesn't last very long. The Americans have the, the Spanish wildly outmatched. And the end result is that the Spanish are going to admit defeat. And part of the peace treaty is that Spain is going to get $20 million from the United States to purchase from the Spanish 
the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam. Now, the Filipinos fought side by side with the Americans thinking that they were fighting for their independence. In fact, the, the Filipinos had issued a Declaration of Independence that was essentially modeled on the American Declaration of Independence, only to find out after the war is over that they weren't getting their independence, that the United States valued the Philippines as a naval base too much and are not going to give the Filipinos their independence. That's not going to happen until after World War II. And in fact, the United States still maintains a naval base on the Philippines. Um, the Filipinos are going to fight back, and there's going to be two, around 200,000 Filipinos die as the Americans look to conquer the, the Philippines. 200,000? Does that number sound familiar? It should, based on what we've talked about today. Um, Puerto Rico and Guam are both U.S. territories today. What about Cuba? Cuba Libre. You know, Cuba was supposed to be one of the reasons why this whole thing was being fought. Technically, Cuba is given its independence, but before the Americans agree to leave the island, when, when the Cubans are writing their new constitution, the Americans basically mandate that they include something that comes to be known as the Platt Amendment. And the Platt Amendment basically says that Cuba has to get American permission before they make any kind of international deal, pretty much before Cuba does anything, they have to get the, the okay of the United States of America. That doesn't really sound like independence because that was, and it's a strange thing because it's theoretically Cuba Libre is one of the things that the United States is fighting for here. The United States still maintains a naval base on the island of Cuba. Guantanamo Bay, it's been in the news in the last 20 years, primarily because that's the place where the United States has been keeping the prisoners of the war on terror housed at Guantanamo Bay. So through the Cold War, through everything that was happening where the, there was essentially no communication or no relationship between the United States and Cuba as a result of Cold War pressures, the United States still maintains a presence on the island of Cuba at Guantanamo Bay, and it's still there today. All right, so at this point, you need to click on that link and answer those questions, and I will see you guys tomorrow.